uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, we'll uh, go through the business with Mr. Smith. Oh, could you mute yourself? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Please note the public section of this meeting will be recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. Can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphone when not speaking? The camera and microphone should only be switched on when you are invited to speak. If you wish to speak, please use your read hand function on the Teams toolbar. I will now ask members participating today to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that this is clear in recording of the meeting and also can be recorded by for the minute. Chair. Present. Vice Chair. Present. Councillor Malik. Councillor Radley. Present. Councillor Cook. Present. Gail Beatty. Present. Andy Borkan. Present. Yvonne Boyd. Present. Susan Esther. Present. Paul Connor. Jonathan Smith. Susan Webb. Present. Chair, we've got apologies from Councillor Greg, um, Angela Scott, Alistair Robertson, Matthew Lockley. Richard McCallum, Duncan Coburn, Peter Edwards, Caroline Hickscox. And we've got Iona here representing Richard McCallum and teams. And we've got um, apologies from Alistair Robertson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we go to declaration of interest. Have any members uh, have any interest or transfer statement to make? Take it as a no, nobody online as well. Uh, so we'll go straight to the minutes 1.1 CPA for minute of the 28th of June 2023 for approval is from page 3 to 22. Uh, anybody has got any question on the minutes? No issues. Everybody is happy with the updates that we have received. Uh, so uh, we'll go uh, straight to 1.2. So draft a CPA management group meeting, 9 of August uh, for information, page 23 to 32. Anything about this minutes? Nothing either. Thank you. Uh, we went to 1.3, uh, Committee Planning Aberdeen Board Forward Planner from page 33 to 36. Any question on the planner? No question on the planner, that's an, an easy afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we'll be happy to note it. Uh, we'll go into 1.4, national update. So it's a variable update. Is Ayana Mayu will be att is attending uh, virtually? I believe, to provide an update from the Scottish Government. Thank you. So the four areas that I'm going to provide updates on are public service reform, housing to 2040, place-based approaches to health and wellbeing and children's rights. Uh, so first of all, looking at public service reform, the policy prospectus set out public service reform as one of the defining missions of the Scottish Government to 2026, as an approach to achieve sustainability. And historical and ongoing reforms have contributed to shifts in how public services are delivered and how resources are used effectively. However, on current trajectories, the sustainability of Scotland's public services is at risk. And so reform is essential for making progress on the three priorities set out in the 23-24 Scottish budget. And these were reducing child poverty, supporting a just transition to a next zero economy and delivering sustainable public services. In the policy prospectus, the Scottish Government restated its priorities, shaped around three interconnected missions, and these were equality, opportunity and community. And the Scottish Government committed to making progress across a 10-year programme of reform. 
So a collaborative approach is being taken on this programme, working with local government under the New Deal to create conditions for transformation and working with public bodies to focus on efficiency and effectiveness. And the Public Service Reform Programme will help deliver fiscally sustainable public services by reducing the costs and reducing long-term demand through investment in prevention, which will reduce inequalities. The reform will also improve outcomes for individuals, families and communities. And the programme builds on existing and ongoing reform activity across the Scottish Government and with partners. The reform work aims to secure efficiencies and improvements by supporting public bodies to consider and implement all options for areas such as efficiencies and managing wage bills, landscape change and service model transformation, including revenue raising. A ministerial control framework has been established, which operates under the assumption that no new bodies and no new public bodies should be created unless essential. And this was considered at Cabinet on the 9th of May 2023 and will launch imminently. So moving on to Housing to 2040. Housing to 2040 is Scotland's long-term strategy for housing, developed following extensive engagement with the housing sector, wider stakeholders and the public, which sets out a vision for what we want Scotland's homes and communities to look like by the end of 2040. It is a vision where homes are affordable for everyone, where standards are the same across all tenures, and where homes have easy access to green space and essential services, along with where homelessness, child poverty and fuel poverty have been eradicated. Housing plays an important part in economic growth, and investing in housing means investment in construction and bringing money into our economy and supporting jobs. And so Housing to 2040 sets out a 20-year plan to deliver good quality, energy efficient, zero emission homes with access to transport links, digital connectivity and community services. The strategy contains hundreds of policies, actions and commitments with several key aspects resting outside the portfolios of the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice and Minister for Housing, and in some cases outside government. The strategy involves working with local authorities, housing providers, landlords and the construction and house building sectors to achieve this. A formal governance process has been established with a strategic board and the board includes Scottish ministers, a COSA wellbeing spokesperson and senior stakeholders from the housing sector. And the board's remit is to provide strategic oversight and support sector wide delivery of housing to 2040 and accountability and progress towards the vision, along with ownership of Housing to 2040 beyond government. And the board is supported by an internal steering group, which consists of Scottish government senior officials, and this provides operational level assurance of progress and is able to escalate issues to the board as needed. So looking at place-based approaches to health and wellbeing, there are large health inequalities between and within population groups across Scotland, representing thousands of premature deaths. And the Place and Wellbeing Programme provides a long-term focus on prevention and addressing the building blocks of health within communities and will support local level action to reduce health inequalities. As part of the Care and Wellbeing Portfolio, it works with partners to understand need at a national level to enable local services to work together using a place-based approach. National policy, guidance and legislation is being used to strengthen local partnerships and enable them to focus on evidence-based action to address some of the root causes of health inequalities in your area. Local areas will have access to specialist public health input to help improve joint decision-making and accountability for outcomes. The Scottish Government are working with Public Health Scotland to provide access to good public health data, evidence and intelligence to inform local action. Scotland's health and social care bodies will be supported to operate as effective anchor institutions. As significant employers and major procurers of goods and services, these providers can play a significant role in building community wealth. The aim is to make it easier for them to employ locally, spend locally and think about how their facilities and land can better serve their community. 
an anchors delivery group is driving forward a work plan and is working with some NHS board as test sites to understand the enablers and barriers to developing their roles as anchor institutions. Community and voluntary organisations are uniquely placed to identify and work on the barriers that individuals face in relation to their health and wellbeing. And a community's core group is driving forward a work plan and is in agreeing an approach for wider engagement. And finally, just touching briefly on children's rights. So the Scottish Government remains committed to the incorporation of the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law. And although the Supreme Court judgment in October 2021 meant that the bill could not receive royal assent in its original form, the intention is that the bill will be amended and returned to the Scottish Parliament in the next few months. An amended bill could be passed by the end of 2023, and if passed, the provisions in the bill could be in place by the middle of 2024. On the 27th of June, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice made a statement in Parliament outlining progress in amending the bill. So to address the Supreme Court judgment, the bill is being amended to focus a compatibility duty on functions conferred by Acts of the Scottish Parliament and remove UK Acts from the application of the interpretive obligation strike down power and incompatibility declarator power. So the amendments will make clear that the legal compatibility duty will not apply when public authorities are delivering under UK Acts, even in devolved areas. And so individual public authorities will be best placed to identify the legal source of their powers. And so key provisions in the bill will be that the bill would make it unlawful for public authorities acting in devolved areas to act incompatibility with the children's requirements and the duties would apply to all public functions within legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament including functions carried out under a contract or other arrangement with a public authority. Legislation in devolved areas would have to be interpreted and given effect to in a way that is compatible with the United Nations requirements. And that would mean that children, young people and their representatives would have a new ability to use the courts to enforce their rights. That was all the policy updates I wanted to give today, but happy to take any questions on any of that. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, report. Any questions? Any questions online? Yes. It, yeah, no, it, it, thank you very much. Really um, helpful update. I, I guess from my perspective, some of the areas that are being touched on, such as working with NHS boards as anchor institutions. I think the conversation at this last community planning meeting where we were talking about community wealth building and joining up local organisation efforts around being an anchor in our communities is absolutely the way forward. So I would wish to feed that back to the policy leads that any single agency work um, supports and enhances the local partnership work in this really uh, important area. Um, and I guess the second point um, is again at our last meeting, we uh, endorsed the Northeast Population Health Alliance. So that is where we are bringing and connecting national and local public health expertise to support our community planning partnerships. So again, just to feed that 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 back, um, but very helpful update. Thank you. Thank yep. you for those comments back. Yeah, very, very good point. And, and I don't know if, if you had uh, the the, the meeting last time with you disappeared after your your comments, after your update uh, last time we met. But uh, that view about partnership and how much in Aberdeen, we are maybe in a different place. <laughs> we talked about what later has to be recognised. It's important that it is recognised. Any other comments? Any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just a just a um, thanks for the presentation. And just a brief comment on the um, on the reconfiguration of public services. Um, I think Audit Scotland has been saying for years that we can't go on as we're going on without some major change. And you see that quite a lot in in the NHS in primary care, where instead of seeing a GP, people might see a, um, a physio or an advanced practice nurse. And actually, that's generally speaking better for the patient. But we, there's a big education job to do with the public to explain what's going on and why it's going on. Um, because I think 
most of us don't like change. We kind of I want to see my GP, um, even though, in fact, the physio is the person who's going to be much, much better for my back. Um, so I just think we, we, we all need to be working on communicating with the public to educate them. That was it. Thank you, Ms. Mayhew. You want to comment on this? Thank you. Those are all really good points, and I'll make sure to feed them back to the policy leads on that. Thank you very much. Is new question, new comments? Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, if we we'll go to uh, the next uh, item, which is 2.1, the population needs assessment 2023, that's page 37 to 132. Uh, Ms. Crombie will present the report. Thank you, Councillor Allard. Um, this is our updated population needs assessment for 2023, which we're asking the board to approve today. Um, the PNA is essential to our understanding of the needs of our city and provides part of our evidence base for making decisions about our priorities for improvement. Um, the timing of the PNA coming to the board today is significant as our outcome improvement groups are now in the process of deliberating what those priorities should be for the LOIP and the locality plans being refreshed um, by April next year. So the document um, provides a useful overview of the situation at this point in time, but we do monitor these data sets on an ongoing basis through our online outcomes framework. So any new data released between now and April will also be considered as part of that development process. There's a lot in here, and as I say, our outcome improvement groups now have the job to consider this data and how it might change our priorities within the LOIP. But what I think is very helpful for partners is that Public Health, NHS, Grampian have provided a useful commentary at the beginning of the document to highlight the areas that we might uh, wish to focus on as part of our discussions. So we've got Phil Mackey, um, the Public Health Consultant, who has provided that narrative with us online today. So I'm not sure if Phil wants to um, make any opening remarks before we take questions. It would be great if, if we could. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Councillor Adelard. Um, my comments are very straightforward. Uh, this is a very welcome document, but it was even more welcome to be able to provide a commentary. I think it's very often um, it's very often difficult to interpret some of the material presented in large scale data compendiums in a way that help and guide. I think, therefore, an ability to facilitate from a public health, population health perspective, that commentary has been welcome. It would be important in future PNAs to see that coming from other sources, not just from a population health source. I know a little about macroeconomic focus, but I'm nowhere near as good as people who can talk to us about the importance of well-being and, and uh, community wealth building. My second comment is to say that obviously my commentary represents what's in the PNA and is li I limited myself to commenting on that data to ensure that we weren't adding new material. But over time, I think we will want to explore further statistical uh, evidence and interpret that to support not just this LOIP, but future LOIPs and future approaches around community well-being that will come under the purview of community planning Aberdeen. That's something that discussion will help evolve over the next phase of LOIP development and uh, over the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And yes, it's not exact science as as it says at the start, but I'm sure there is a way to uh, to improve it. And there's other sources than other than public health. Will maybe interesting to see if everybody could uh, could uh, could do this. I, I I've seen that uh, uh, a point of detail before I take uh, Mr. Merkel who wants to come in. Uh, on the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, uh, I see that. Uh, most recent release was in 2020. Are we expecting an update on that, Mr. McKay? Um, um, I don't. Sorry, you go ahead first, Martin. 
So the um, the SIMD, the indices of multiple deprivation, are, have been normally done every four years nationally. So we would be expecting them next year. Um, while I'm talking, so I agree uh, with um, Phil in, in his comments about the importance of it and the value of it. But absolutely, I agree with him as well that there's more we can do. Um, discussions we've had in preparation um, with this PNA include more uh, connection to the the work that I'm involved in with Phil around um, research and um, health determinants research, but also we've had discussions about how we get more of a, a community voice, lived experience into the um, document as well. And I guess my last comment is just that point about um, that uh, Michelle made around updating the data. So there will be significant data coming out um, before April. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll be getting uh, census data around um, population demographic stuff. So um, it's as we go through the process with the outcome improvement groups and other stakeholders to, to consider this and refresh the Lloyd will be feeding all of that into the, to, to those discussions too. So then Mr. Mackey wanted to come back, yeah. I think actually uh, Martin has has provided the majority of my comment. Um, I think this is a good example of the way in which we are able to broker through a range of organisations and a range of relationships the type of information that keeps us up to, to speed and potentially has a, a chance of, of increasing our understanding of the populations we serve and that is only to be welcomed. Very interesting. Patrick, if we know that our population in Aberdeen is moving fast <laughs> in, in and out of Aberdeen and in and out of different areas as well. It's the reason I ask, uh, we look forward for the update in 2024 when we understand a little more what the difference it is over four years in the most deprived areas. Any questions? Any more comment? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for the report. Um, one thing I just want to kind of just draw out, it's maybe more as an observation rather than a question, um, because we had a lot of discussion and debate at um, our last meeting around about mental health, um, and um, some members in the room might be familiar with a paper that Police Scotland had shared around about the impacts upon mental health on policing and other services. And I note that it's obviously mental health within this do document as well as... as, as uh, um, Part of the needs analysis and also is something from a public sector perspective i, I believe and i think partners would all agree as well we need to um, look at different ways of working we need to look at different ways of working together to try and um make a difference um from just st standard ways we were doing I, i'm probably just raise it as a, what's the best way for us to try and start that conversation i don't think it's through community planning um, but i do think there's a need for partners to come together to think about different ways because the, the mental health aspect covers a whole range of things not just the impacts upon policing but you know it's, it's quite clear within this paper the impacts it has on it in terms of substance misuse suicide rates um etc there's a number of really um upsetting impact factors of of of, of, of the mental health crisis that were faced um, and I don't think any agency can can handle that singularly. Um, so I'll probably just pause there more just an observation of thoughts uh, from anybody else's thoughts about maybe how we could take this that that one particular piece I don't want to necessarily narrow down just on the mental health bit but it's something from a policing perspective it's probably one of the most significant aspects from from a public service uh, issue. Mr Mackey wants maybe to for the point? Um, I, I think there's a, there's a couple of, of issues here. I think the first is we actually have a much broader range of materials which can be used to inform and perhaps that's something that that where CPA board has received material previously that could be uh, circulated alongside the, the population need assessment. But I think actually uh, that the comment actually goes a little bit deeper and it refers back to my my point around the need for interpretation and guidance and i think helping and supporting through that loip uh, redevelopment process the refresh is where the majority of that type of thinking needs to be taking place and helping and supporting individuals to lead us into uh, improvement programs which will start more effectively to address the type of concerns that are being raised 
I should also, however, point out that we we have within NHS Grampian uh, a strong interest within the context of public mental health, which I'm sure that Susan Webb may want to, to comment on further. But that's an area where I think we do look for strategic alliance to ensure that we are all uh, pulling in the appropriate direction to help and support the mental health and well-being of the communities. Susan, you've been invited. Yeah, thank you very much. Because I, I think there's a, a few things, and I, I did get um, back. Um, I, I suppose the first thing, in terms of uh, mental public health, we have a network which brings um, practitioners together from across three community planning partnerships in the northeast. Um, the initial meeting um, focused in on sharing practice about what is happening, uh, because clearly there is a lot of work underway. I think the big key message that came back was around um, data around mental well-being as opposed to mental ill health. So again, some work with I'm sure Martin's involved uh, with Corey and others uh, around um, pulling together a dashboard. They've also looked at some um, evidence base around the things that we might want to focus in on. And so the network continues to meet to shape that up. But happy to bring a more detailed report back to this meeting if that is helpful. The second area I think that was raised was around um, mental ill health and distress. Um, and again, on the back of the report mentioned, I picked that up with uh, Sandra McLeod, who leads the Unscheduled Care Programme. And I think she's been in touch with your colleagues and the idea will be that your report will come into the Unscheduled Care Programme Board for a conversation about the areas that we need to work on together as it pertains to um, ill health. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Yes, and how to feed it. We can see Ms. Crumby and, and, and I find a way to, best to feed it. Anybody wants to add anything? No, no, thanks, Susan. That's appreciated. And again, um, it's it's such a significant issue, not just for um, our, our communities, but for our services as well. Um, because certainly from, from my perspective, um, my services, the police often feel a little bit helpless and, and wanting to help and just know we've got an absolute place in it. Um, so, but, but I think we've got good partnership networks and oh, oh, I agree with everything that, that Susan mentioned there. We've got a maturity to how we approach these things, but I, I will take every opportunity through forums like this to make sure we're continuing the conversation and it's and it's not just conversations that, that we, we need to start to take do things differently as well. But I'm, I'm reassured we've got the right people and, and um, we're sharing our experiences and data. Mrs. Rossi, Chief Superintendent, any other? Yes, Councillor Radley. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, it's probably more of a, quite a comment than a question. Um, on page 64, we've got some data around um, food security and then food bank use. And um, the two don't seem to match up. Um, the, the respondents from City Voice um, have not appeared to have any food insecurity, although um, there, I guess there is a concern around undernutrition, um, but there are um, rising levels of food bank use, um, especially among sort of working age populations. Um, and it might, it might be helpful to have an understanding of, you know, um, how that sort of translates across um, Aberdeen, but also um, as we work to refresh the loop, especially um, whether there needs to be some further engagement with other groups around City Voice, because um, I don't want to say that it's not representative of the population, because um, you work very hard to ensure that there is a representative spread. But are we making sure that we're targeting all sort of areas of, of the population um, through the refresh? I suppose it means you have to reach how to reach, how to reach. Anyone want to respond to this? Mr. Mackey or Ms. Crombie? Ms. Crombie. Um, thank you, Councillor. Yes, you're right to highlight um, 
some of the limitations of City Voice, obviously, we try to ensure it's a representative um, sample of the population, but certainly in our deprived communities, we recognise we would like to improve representation there. Um, that said, we would still recognise that these results do show that there is um, food poverty um, across the city. And certainly when you drill down to locality level, you can see that um, even more. Um, there is something about how people answer those questions. And I guess certainly if people feel that they are not having to skip a meal, that may very well be because they are accessing um, affordable food outlets. So there is a potential connection there. Um, but we certainly don't only rely on these results within our locality plans. Food poverty is a common theme across all three. So we are listening to the voice of communities as well as considering the data. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I guess where does undernutrition come into food security, um, I guess, is my second question, because although people may have access to food, it may not be nutritious food. It may not be um, the foods that we would see as healthy. Um, so I guess an understanding of that might be helpful. I, I, I understand the limitations of the document in front of us, so I'm not asking you to comment on it just now, but maybe in the future that can be something that can be built in because um, access to regular meals is very important. Access to healthy food is also very important um, and there, there's a distinction there. Thank you. If, if I might come in, Councillor uh, Allard. Um, so I think there is a, 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 a very interesting question that you pose there about the nature of how we understand the needs that are reported in this type of data. I think the, the way in which we help LIPE groups look at this material and understand not only what it's saying to us, but how it guides our response is, yes, it's not an exact science, but that's part of the process we're about to start. I would, however, also mention the uh, uh, health determinants research collaboration that, that Martin's already mentioned, as food insecurity is an area that we are exploring and looking at improving uh, material uh, which can inform our, our work across the city, particularly within the context of lived experience. I think understanding how people describe their circumstances is an important way of, of helping us better use this type of material in the future. Very helpful. Thank you very much, Councillor Radley, and thank you very much for, for the response. Any other comment or questions? No? Oh, yes, go ahead. Just to um, commend the document, really, um, just from a real world use of the previous version, um, putting it into a funding application for external funding, actually having the document there and all the different types of information in it was really helpful and resulted in successfully getting funding into the city. So I think it's important that we've got it, obviously, how we get it out there, how we actually use it as well um, is key because there will that won't be the only example, but there's be lots of examples of where it has had a positive impact and how we can really use that. Um, definitely a go-to kind of Bible for, for a lot of data. So um, yeah, positive, I think, from, from certainly our point of view. Thank you very much for that. And it's a good note to, to end up really uh, correcting everybody who's done the work uh, around it and how making sure that we use it uh, the best way. OK, everybody agrees on the uh, recommendation, which is approving the assessment in Appendix 1, and agrees that partners take the final provision assessment to the respective organizations. And I think that is the point that you just made, uh, to consider the key findings alongside the most strategic plans. If everybody agree, we'll go to uh, the next item of the agenda, which is 2.2 Community Planning Abilene Annual Outcome Improvement Report 2022-2023 from pages 133 to 208. Uh, Alison Swanson will uh, provide a presentation as well as introduction. So let's see if it works. Next year, Google's just going to share the slides for me if that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to give a brief presentation to introduce our annual outcome improvement report. 
So the report that you have before you today details the work that has been undertaken by Community Planning Aberdeen between the 1st of April 2022 and the 31st of March 2023 to progress our 16 stretch outcomes and our improvement aims. The report also sets out our key achievements as well as the areas we seek to improve in 2023 and 2024 in advance of the refresh of the LOIP. So to the next slide, Gogo. Just wait. Oh, yeah. So how are we doing? So as I said, we have 16 stretch outcomes that we're working to achieve by 2026. So as at the 31st of March 2023, five of our stretch outcomes had been achieved or exceeded. Ten were progressing and one we were seeing challenges with. As well as showing progress towards the 16 stretch outcomes, the report also includes a what impact have we had section under each of the themes, and that's to show progress towards our improvement aims. So as at March, we had 74 improvement aims to be achieved by 2023, and 41 of those have ended, of which 29 had achieved their aims. So I'm going to now look very briefly at each theme to see where we're at in terms of the stretch outcomes for each, and also touch upon some of the key highlights and areas for improvement going forward. The specific interventions tested to support the outcomes are detailed in the report, so I'm not going to touch upon them in the presentation. So go, go. Oh, you're on to economy. That's great. So our economy theme. So we've got three stretch outcomes under this theme. So for the first stretch outcome is stretch outcome one. And here you can see that the data is showing that we have a challenge in terms of achieving that stretch outcome. The latest data available shows that we've had a 1.9% increase in the percentage of City Voice respondents who reported that during the last 12 months there was a time that they were worried that they would not have enough food to eat. So this position reflects the impact of the cost of living, which is impacting all households across the city with the rising cost of food and energy, but felt most acutely by those on the lowest incomes. So our anti-poverty group in the reporting period have focused on interventions to support individuals to maximise their income and to check their benefit entitlement, but also to provide support in relation to fuel bills and access to food, with a particular focus on our priority neighbourhoods. This has seen 696 households helped with fuel bills and with £134,464.52 in fuel bill savings. Also through the benefit calculator, 3,578 people have had unclaimed benefits identified. However, there is a lot more to do to be done to remove people from poverty. And it's a priority for our anti-poverty group to further raise awareness of support available, but also to identify other ways to increase income, such as using data to auto award, and also in supporting people presenting as homeless to complete a financial assessment at that point. In comparison, data for stretch outcomes two and three is showing a positive position. Across both of those stretch outcomes, a range of improvements have been tested. And from those, we've seen that 44% of stretch outcome two has been achieved, with 175 people supported into sustained good quality employment. And for stretch outcome three, that has been exceeded, with 595 people upskilled or reskilled absolutely not complacent and we have a number of priorities for the year ahead that these, these stretch outcomes will be taken forward, mainly focusing on targeting employability support to reduce inequalities, but also as you saw with the project end report last cycle, there's also further work to be done in supporting completion rates for modern apprenticeships. Now moving on to the children and young people's theme. Sorry, thanks, Gogo. As I said at the beginning, the report covers the period April 22 to March 23, and therefore it reflects the position of the children and young people's theme prior to the revised stretch outcomes of four to nine being approved by the board in April 2023. So pre-revision, we had three stretch outcomes that had been achieved and embedded, and three were progressing. So just to touch briefly upon some of the achievements and impact, a range of targeted inter initiatives were focusing on reducing preventable harms to children pre and post birth. And as a result of those, we've seen a 67% decrease in births affected by drugs, 
an 11% reduction in the number of unintentional repeat hospital admissions for under fives, and a 52% increase in up the uptake of parenting support, all of which have supported our stretch outcome for being exceeded by 2.1%, with 97.1% of children having a 27 to 30 month review, having met their developmental milestones. So helping all young people, regardless of their circumstances, reach their potential continues to be a top priority for this theme and across each of the stretch outcomes within it. Data available for the period showed that a 13% increase in care experienced young people had achieved a positive and sustained destination, but also that we had a 40% reduction in the number of under 18s offending, including a 21% reduction in the number of care experienced young people offending. And whilst that's really positive and heartening to see the impact that our projects are having, we know that we have more to do and that we can't be complacent. So reducing inequalities and child poverty continues to be a top priority within the revised stretch outcome four to nine. And we have 34 improvement projects taking those forward. So go, go if we can move on. So in our adults theme, we have three stretch outcomes. And as you'll see there, two of those have been achieved or exceeded. So in relation to stretch outcome 10, that's been exceeded. And in this area, through new interventions and raising awareness of support available, we've seen a 47% increase in people accessing domestic abuse support and an increase by 59% in people accessing mental health support in police custody and a 55% increase in people accessing that support in HMP Grampian. We've also supported 63 individuals engaged in the justice system to make progress on the employability pipeline. In relation to stretch outcome 11, we've seen a slight increase in healthy life expectancy at birth for both males and females over the last reporting period. And the projects in that area have focused on supporting people to make healthier life choices through a range of community-based interventions, which have contributed to an 8% reduction in people smoking and have supported 106 people to feel confident to promote well-being and good health choices both of which you're going to hear more about later on today's agenda when you consider the project end reports for those. In terms of stretch outcome 12, latest data has shown that this has now been achieved with a 4% reduction in harmful levels of drinking. And we've now seen that the five year average drug related death rates for Aberdeen are now lower than Scotland, with specifically a 32% reduction in drug related deaths since 2021 and 22% since the baseline period. So key to this has been reducing the harm caused by alcohol and drugs through targeted interventions, such as alcohol awareness, naloxone and distribution, and the sharp response, sharp response and crisis response, which has supported 226 people to date. However, there is more to do across all three stretch outcomes and priorities for the year ahead for the three include tackling domestic abuse through targeted training and awareness raising, and hate crime through the expansion of our third party reporting centres. We're also focused on earlier and preventative interventions for people most vulnerable to harm caused by poverty, homelessness, mental health and drugs and alcohol. So if we can move on to our police theme. Thanks, Gogo. So all three stretch outcomes in our police theme are progressing and specifically wanted to touch upon stretch outcome 13, where we've seen a 46.3% reduction in carbon emissions from our baseline, with a 7.7% reduction in carbon emissions in the last reporting period. This has been supported by our Green Champions who have run a number of initiatives over the year to raise awareness and also to support behaviour change, both in the workplace and at home. Our communities have also played a big part in the achievements across all of the place themed projects. And one example of that's been the 122% increase in community run and green spaces being achieved. And this has been supported by the 16% increase in volunteers supporting green initiatives with to date 4,792 volunteers in this area. Recognising the important role and the impact of our communities, a top priority is for us to empower and support communities to develop community led resilience plans with plans to be in place for all communities at risk of flooding by 
the next year. In relation to stretch outcome 14 and 15, again, we're seeing these progressing with data showing an increase in both walking and cycling. However, we've got more to do. And over the next period, we're aiming to implement new initiatives to further promote the sustainable travel choices, such as increasing access to bikes for all through our bike recycling project. Gogo, if you want to go then go on to our next one. So our final theme is community empowerment. So in the reporting period, the community empowerment strategy was approved by the board. And this also saw the introduction of stretch outcome 16, with the ambition for all communities across Aberdeen to be equal community planning partners. As part of the launch of the community empowerment strategy, we held our first community gathering event. Also in the report, you can see the key impact that's still ongoing in terms of our Fairer Aberdeen Fund initiatives and also through our community learning and development. A key part of us achieving this stretch outcome and the ambition of this strategy is by working together with our communities and through our underpinning locality plans developed by our locality empowerment groups and our priority neighbourhood partnerships. And from the locality plan annual reports later on today's agenda, you'll see the clear link between our LOIC projects and how we're working with communities to tackle the priority issues in those plans. So key priorities for this theme for the year ahead include refreshing the locality plans and co-designing a community engagement toolkit to support staff and communities to work together. So in terms of, yeah, thanks, sorry. So in terms of next steps, subject to approval today of the report, our annual report will be used by our outcome improvement groups alongside the population needs assessment and the locality annual reports to evaluate progress to date. And that will be alongside our community and stakeholder engagement that is due to happen in terms of the refresh. And this will support them identify their proposed improvement priorities for the period 2024 to 2026. Our annual report will also be published and shared with all partners. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation. Uh, have we got any question and comment in the room or online? Anybody? I might have one to start with. You know, I've seen that uh, uh, the urban city life expectancy at birth um, have fallen slightly for women 81 years and women static for men 76.9 years. I didn't see enough on discrimination as well regarding uh, what we can do a woman uh, unemployment. We are quite static as well. So I don't know if our reports show enough about uh, about women uh, uh, in in that report, I I didn't see enough about women. Am I am I missing the point? Have I missed something? Uh, so so the page uh, what I was just talking about is uh, uh, on life expectancy is on page one two three eighty two of the report. And let me check the next one. Sorry, Councillor Hallard. Um, yes, Chair, the report itself doesn't speak about specific interventions focused um, specifically towards the female population within that, but we can certainly add that in in terms of future reporting. Yeah, I, I, I would think it, it's 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 missing a little bit. I, I can't find the other one, but if somebody has a question, I'll find it. Any other question or comment? If I don't, I will do it offline. OK, if you have no more question or comment, we can thank you very much for the report and uh, and for the presentation. And uh, we'll go to the next one, which is uh, 2.3, if you agree and note it, which is locality out annual outcome improvement report 2022-2023 for the three localities, north, south and central. That's from page 209 to page 272. Miss Comey. Thank you, Councillor Allard. So we've also got a presentation on these plans for you this afternoon. So, Gogo, if you could just go to slideshow. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, so Alison's taken us through the progress we've made to deliver our citywide LOIP. Um, and now we're going to drill down a wee bit into our three localities and the progress we've made in delivering our three locality plans. So to start, I just wanted to give the board a quick reminder of why we have locality plans sitting beneath our citywide LOIP. As members know, locality plans are a statutory requirement for community planning partners. And the purpose of locality planning is to ensure that we're improving outcomes for all communities across the city, including people living in our most deprived neighbourhoods. So you'll be aware that our citywide data, it can conceal communities which are experiencing the kind of inequality and poorer outcomes that we're seeking to address. But by taking a locality planning approach, we build a better understanding of the variation that exists across the city so that we can be targeted in our response. And a second function of locality planning is that we know it's often easiest for communities to participate in community planning at that locality and neighbourhood level, where it has most relevance to people's lives and to their circumstances. So as well as being data led, we are also being led by the voices of local people Therefore, a large part of our locality planning model is about engaging and empowering individuals and community groups to work with us to make improvements in their area. So just a wee reminder why we have those underpinning plans. I'm joined by Jade Layden um, and Ian Robertson this afternoon for these this item. Um, Jade works in my team. She's the Community Development Manager and Ian Robertson is the Senior Transformation Manager for the Health and Social Care Partnership. Hope I've got that title right, Ian. Um, Jade and Ian, they've been co-leading co our locality planning for Community Plan in Aberdeen since February of this year and they're the co-authors of the locality reports before you today. So we're just going to take you through a few slides to pull out some of the key highlights of the locality plan reports. So go, go, if you can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So you'll have seen in the papers that the locality plans are structured around the same themes as the LOIP. So starting with economy, then people, place and community empowerment. And although they all share that common structure, the priorities under each theme have been identified by local people and so they do vary across the three locality plans, although you'll see that there are similarities. So in this slide I've pulled out just some of the key outcome measures that are included in the reports under the economy sections and unsurprisingly in the current cost of living crisis, tackling poverty is a priority across all three locality plans. So. As Councillor um, Radley has already highlighted last year, we used our citizens panel to ask some key questions about how people are coping during this time. And specifically, we asked them questions about food and fuel poverty. As you can see, there is some variation across the three locality areas. But again, not surprising, the figures that indicate the greatest need are in our most deprived neighbourhoods. So what you're seeing on the screen there is the percentage of people worried that they don't have enough to eat that ranged from 7.2% to 9.7% across the three localities. But if you look at the figures I've presented in brackets, these relate to the people living in our most deprived neighbourhoods, those um, areas that we call our priority neighbourhoods. Um, and within these localities, the, late, the rates are significantly higher, um, with three times as many people worrying about food in the most deprived areas of the north and south locality. And we can also see variation again between our most deprived areas. So as you can see on the slide, we've got over 10% more people in the north priority neighbourhoods are experiencing food insecurity than people in the central priority neighbourhoods. So we do want to unpick that with the people living in these areas so that we can understand what we can do to, to address those inequalities. Also on the slide, we can see even higher rates of fuel poverty across the three localities. Again, not surprising with everything that we know is going on. Um, but again, this almost doubles for some of our priority neighbourhoods in these localities with nearly a 20% difference there between our most deprived communities and the wider locality in North and Central. 
So finally, I've drawn out the percentage of children in low income families. This is data provided by DWP and it shows that across the board, just over half our children living in low income families are living in priority neighbourhoods, which again won't be a surprise to you. But it does also reveal that just under half are living in other areas of the city. So these are the pockets of deprivation which exist out with priority neighbourhoods that can go unseen in our data. So if you could go on the next slide, please. Um, so what have we been doing over the last year to make things better for people? Well, through our LOIP improvement projects, as Alison's just run through, um, we've taken forward a wide range of initiatives to alleviate suffering due to poverty. And these are detailed in the LOIP and locality plan annual reports. Now, some of our interventions have been rolled out across the city for universal application to prevent inequality and others have been targeted at specific areas and communities. So I'm not going to read through the list on the screen. It is in the reports, um, but you can see from that that our work has ranged from taking immediate action to help people suffering from poverty now to invest in, in longer term improvements in the economy. If you could go on the next slide, Gogo. Moving on to people again, I've pulled out just some of our key outcome measures under the people themes in the locality plans to show you that comparison across. We're not seeing quite as much variation across the localities for our people outcomes, but the variation is still there. I've pulled out our initial school leavers data on positive destinations, which is a key outcome for our young people. And it shows that in the north and south, positive destinations are below the citywide average and in the central locality, they're higher. So another area for us to explore with communities. Next, we've already looked at data on food poverty, but as Councillor Radley pointed out earlier, um, we here we're considering um, people's means to access healthy, nutritious food, which is a really important measure of our overall health and well-being. So we are seeing some variation across the localities here and rates are higher for the priority neighbourhoods within the localities. So again, poverty having an impact on people's health and well-being. And finally, I've pulled out life expectancy, which we use as a measure of the overall health of our population. Now, since 2012, life expectancy has plateaued in general across Aberdeen and Scotland, and we've, we've seen that in the PNA. Um, people in Aberdeen have a similar life expectancy to other areas of Scotland, but again, you'll see that this is lower in our priority neighbourhood. So, for example, in the south locality, male life expectancy is almost five years lower for males living in Torrey and Kingcourt. So, the gap in life expectancy is even greater in some of our smaller geogra geographies across the city and the PNE highlighted the difference of roughly 14 years between Woodside and our more prosperous areas of the city. Um, go, go. Next slide, please. So again, the reports that you've got before you this afternoon detail the wide range of activities which we've taken forward in partnership to improve outcomes for children and young people and our most Vulnerable, vulnerable members of the community. But I think it's important to highlight that a large number of these initiatives are being led by communities themselves, and we highlight that in the locality plans, um, particularly with assistance from the Health Improvement Fund and the Fairer Aberdeen Fund, which empowers communities to lead the changes that they want to see and that can make the biggest difference for local people. And there are many examples right across the three themes within the, the three plans. So I'm going to hand over to Ian now and he's going to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you, Michelle. So I'll just briefly take you through um, a summary of the place theme and uh, community empowerment and our next steps. Um, so as you see on the screen there, um, satisfaction with green space, it's highest um, in the south locality. Uh, but also, interesting enough, it's the biggest gap in satisfaction from 71.6% uh, to 50.1% in a priority, priority neighbourhood. So that's um, uh, tw over 21% difference uh, in satisfaction in the general locality and the priority neighbourhood. Um, and north and central are relatively similar. 
Um, in terms of people cycling in the last year, it's highest in the central locality and the south is higher than the citywide average and it's lowest in the north locality. Um, we want to just draw members' attention to uh, an inaccuracy in the, the data, which is in the report at this point. Uh, it's in the north and central plans uh, and we will amend that um, before it's published. Um, just to let you know. Yeah, that's very kind of you because I, I didn't notice it and we're not in Amsterdam. I, I think even in Amsterdam, there wouldn't be 90% of people uh, using yeah. the bike. I've seen, and Jed could maybe help, but there's nothing on the south on, on cycling. I'm, I live in Tori, I live in the south and I do cycle. <laughs> uh, it'll be great to have that as well, just to, to be able to compare uh, south, central and, and north. Yeah, thanks for that, Chair. Um, we take them comments on board uh, and for consistency, we're happy to include that. Uh, I think why it wasn't included was that it was the, the, the members, the community members themselves didn't place it high enough in the priority to make it into the locality plan. But if members would find it helpful for us to include it for consistency, we'd be happy to do so. To leave two of us to decide, but if happy for my suggestion. No, thanks very much. For, that would be very helpful. And as far I know, it's not 90%. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, Google, can I just move on to the next slide, please? Um, so what we've done over the last year, so we've increased the number of community food growing projects across the city. So for instance, uh, St. Fittick's Edible Garden and Tullis Community Garden. Um, the City Council, along with the Big Issue, has um, launched the, the e-bikes programme across the city. Uh, we've promoted act active travel opportunities for walking and cycling, footpaths, uh, that sort of thing, uh, and funding streams for community members and groups, uh, for instance, our locality empowerment groups and our priority neighbourhood partnerships. Um, so examples of, of that could be through Transport Scotland or Paths for All. Uh, and the Community Learn Development uh, Family Learn team have worked with disadvantaged young people and families to encourage use of uh, the city's natural assets, um, our parks, our green spaces and our beaches um, for health benefits, creative outdoor learning and play. Um, just the next slide there, Google, please. So um, turn uh, to community empowerment. I don't want to um, kind of double down and duplicate what Alison mentioned in terms of uh, the launch of the community empowerment strategy. What I would like to highlight is uh, one of the main differences from this year to previous years is, especially during the COVID years, is that we've, with the reduction or um, the elimination of the uh, social distance and restrictions, it enables us to have larger scale um, engagement events such as the community gathering, which I know a number of you attended uh, in May. And we also had uh, the Public Health uh, Health Social Care Partnership Granite City gathering uh, on the 24th of June. So they were attended by um, 120 odd people, I think attendees delegates wise at uh, the community gathering and about 167 delegates um, not including um, the people who had stalls at the Granite City Gathering. So it was good to see um, these large scale events take off again as another tool in our communication uh, armory. Uh, in terms of the locality empowerment groups, um, they've uh, restarted in April um, and we've had two cycles of meetings. Uh, the meetings are, agendas are determined by community members. Um, and the next round of meetings uh, will um, be held actually at community venues uh, and they will be uh, happening between September and October this year. Uh, the priority neighbourhood partnerships have continued to meet over the, uh, over the COVID period um, and uh, they also have pre-meetings uh, where members determine uh, the agenda moving forward and they're actually chaired by community members as well, which is, a, which is extremely positive. Um, I think that's all I'd like to say on community empowerment at this point. I'm just happy to move on to the next slide, Gogo. So in terms of the next steps, uh, our annual reports will be published uh, once they've been through um, the IGB's Risk uh, Audit and Performance Committee and also goes, this report will also go to full council in October. Uh, the locality planning team, which myself and Jade lead, um, we are planning to use the Public Health Scotland uh, Place Standard tool to engage for our local communities uh, to inform the refresh of our locality plans. And these workshop sessions uh, will take place during October. 
Um, the locality plans, as Alison mentioned, are due to be refreshed alongside uh, the wider LOIP um, uh, by April uh, 2024. And uh, locality planning updates will continue to be provided to the community empowerment group uh, on a monthly basis to provide assurance on, on what we're what we're getting up to. Um, so that's my update. Happy to receive any comments or questions that members have. I made my comment already. Any other comments? Yeah, Councillor. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, it was a, it was a question on. I hope we scribbled this down correctly. It was on one of the slides. It was showing the. Um, I think it was north, and it was people reporting they were unable to eat healthily due to poverty. And if I wrote down the numbers correctly, the figure was higher for the north as a whole than it was in priority areas. Did I misread that? And if I didn't, do we know what's going on there? It just sounded a bit strange. It's one that I want to double check when I was putting this together because um, that jumped at me as well. Um, certainly, if there, assuming there is no error um, in that figure, um, we definitely want to understand why that is higher across the locality. Um, than the priority neighbourhood partnerships, but I will double check that with um, our city voice analyst, and um, hopefully there's there's not an error. Otherwise, we'll look into it. Councillor Cook is reassured. Any other question online or any comment uh, in the room? No, uh, we are happy to. Uh, I just I want to congratulate again for the committee gathering. Uh, it looks fantastic. It looks fantastic on the photo, but I was very looks fantastic itself. And it, it was even extremely busy. I wonder if a repeat will be able to do the kind of hold the way we did it. We maybe need to find a bigger venue. What do you think? Uh, th thanks very much. I, I have to give the, the credit to, to Jade and, uh, and Michelle and the, the wider community planning team. Uh, they did an absolutely fantastic job, and I think that's it's important to, to be noted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the free reports. Uh, they, they're going to help us a lot uh, all the way through, and uh, that will be an interesting point to, to compare. Yeah, my point, I'm, I made it an email. We need to be a little bit better at, at maybe breaking down a little bit uh, men and women. I still have that, that little worry that we don't enough. Mr. Robertson, you have to come back. Um, it, it wasn't really to comment on the, the sort of, uh, I take the point about the um, a breaking down into in terms of females. Um, we do have something in our uh, locality plans in terms of the Stay Well, Stay Connected programme, which does cover initiatives that are targeted at, at females. So for instance, our Mighty Oaks project, which is targeted at uh, women going through the menopause. Uh, and um, uh, uh, our bereavement programmes as well, um, which tend to uh, impact women uh, statistically more than men, as we've seen from the life expectancy figures. So maybe we weren't explicit enough, but we I think there is some things in our locality plans that, that do uh, specifically reference um, what we're doing for women. There seems to be a lot of reports coming out where a woman seems to having a, a, a bad time, especially the cost of living crisis, seems to, to increase the vulnerability on, 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 on women. And we've seen it on expectation, expectancy, life expectancy. Uh, I was shocked to see that uh, it was stable for men, but it was coming down for, for, for women, even if it's higher in, in the city. So maybe some, some, something to, to look at, double check before we, we print those reports. Anybody wants to make any contribution or any more? No, so uh, are we happy to approve uh, the free locality plan and will report? I agree the submission to uh, the reports to full council will be on 11 of October 2023. And uh, to consider the report and contribution to the uh, committee planning happening and all outcome improvement report. Good. Uh, we'll go to the uh, next item, which is a uh, 2.4, the Scottish Parliament report on community planning inquiry, implication for community planning Aberdeen 273 to 280. I think we touched a little bit on that early on, uh, but it will be great to hear a little bit more. Uh, Miss Crombie again. 
Thank you, Chair. As requested at the last board meeting, this paper identifies the possible implementation um, implication, sorry, of the Scottish Parliament's inquiry into community planning. So in general, it's proposed that we as a community planning partnership would be supportive of the recommendations, but also noting that in most cases we already have local arrangements in place which would see us meet these recommendations. Um, of note, one of the recommendations 23 and 26 is that the Scottish Government ensures that CPPs are sufficiently resourced, so it's proposed that Community Plan in Aberdeen welcomes these recommendations and the recognition of the need for additional resourcing for CPPs if we're to fulfil um, our full potential. Um, understand that ministers will be invited to join a future local government housing and planning committee to discuss their response to the findings, but that, that meeting hasn't happened yet. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Crumby. Yeah, we, we, we asked for it because I think we, we need to note it. Uh, this engagement is very, very important. Uh, I know that we may be uh, at some point a little bit ahead of the local authorities, but, you know, like Ms. Webb said earlier on, it's important that we show that we are, and to a certain extent that uh, Parliament and government take that into consideration when we go into uh, legislation that we recognise that we are all at different levels. And I was absolutely delighted to see that uh, there is a recommendation in it which says, uh, as the Scottish Government um, uh, will take uh, uh, will take uh, the delivery of uh, improved income at all level, and it will use as evidence of uh, of Aberdeen's review committee planning uh, to consider uh, that whatever, but I'm sure they will. But Aberdeen uh, work uh, to align objectives should be used as a case study. So, so I think it's something we should congratulate officers for that. Uh, I think it's important to to make our voice heard uh, with government and with parliament, and to make sure that you can share good practice. And it looks like that you have a lot more to share of good practice that we will do first of all. So, so you know that's been very helpful. Any question or any remarks? Yes, speak. So I guess it's not so much a question, but just sort of reflecting on the part, particularly around about resilience. So as we've had our two days of Aberdeen summer and we're heading towards the winter, I think it's really important that what what the report's saying in terms of the potential for everyone and um, recognising their part in that resilience journey, because we've worked through the light to have a lot of community involvement in, in um, local resilience. But there's no doubt about it with changing weather patterns, there's a lot of pressure on most of the people that sit around the community planning partnership. And I think it's helpful just to acknowledge everybody's role, particularly in some of the joint work that's been carried out in terms of identifying vulnerable people so that we're not we're all working off a common list. So I think I think it was really helpful that um, the report picked up on that because I think that is something where we have um, struggled and I know the fire service have been doing a great job um, trying to get through that um, Lloyd project but um, I think this will be a really helpful um, bit of power to our elbow to, to move that forward. Thanks Chair. Yeah, very good point. Local outcome improvement plan uh, will will be we go into a next session, and I, I know that a lot of our officers will be working very hard, and and all our partners will be involved in it, uh, and uh, they have to be thankful for, for for the effort, which which is very important. Councillor Cook. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just just briefly, totally agree with your comments about the um uh, the. The thing in paragraph 2.1, which talks about Aberdeen being used as an example of good practice. I'm just thinking that we've got a number of officers in the in the room here who will have heard that comment. I'm also thinking that we've got a number of reports that are the result of team efforts. So maybe Mrs. Beatty or someone could write to all the people, all the officers involved to say well done, as well as just recording it in here in case they weren't watching the webcast. Sorry, I don't want to create Mrs. Beatty having lots of emails to write, but did he? Happy to do so, but equally happy if the chair wishes to take on that role. But we can discuss that offline. Yes, and I'm sure the vice chair would, would like to, to add as well. But, but, but it, it may be a good idea, uh, Councillor Cook, if everybody uh, agree on this and we can take that offline. Any other point to make? No, so we are happy with the recommendations which are on page uh, 
2.74, and I suppose it is to note and to agree. Uh, yes, uh, so recommendations are very, yes. So we are all happy with the recommendations, note and to approve the implication identified for committee planning Aberdeen. So if you're happy with that, we'll go to the next item, which is uh, uh, Committee Planning Aberdeen Improvement Program Quarterly Update and Appendices. So it's page 281 to 306. And of course, we we put on the appendix some of the links. Uh, one didn't work, but I think it was sent again. I think it was the third one. So 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 that was done. Hopefully, uh, everybody uh, have seen it. Uh, who would like to? Thanks, Chair. Um, the report presents an update on progress towards the 16 stretch outcomes and the 18 9 improvement projects spanning both the LOIP and the community empowerment strategy. So, Appendix 1 provides the detailed overview, and that's showing that of those 16 stretch outcomes at present, three have been achieved, 12 are progressing, and one with the challenges which we referred to earlier. In terms of the 89 improvement aims, 50 of those are now live, 18 have ended, and you have 11 new charters for consideration at Appendix 2 today, and you have two further project end reports at Appendix 3 for your consideration. There are six projects within the improvement programme at present with a red ragging status, and the chairs of the respective outcome improvement groups have been meeting with those project managers to address any issues and to ensure that progress is made. Happy to take any questions, or if not, I'm happy to move on to Mr. Simpson, who is here to speak to the 11 project charters, which all come from the stretch outcomes four to nine under the Children's Services Board. Then we have um, Mr. Chris Miley present to speak to the two project end reports at Appendix three. Okay, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, convener speak to the work of the Children's Services Board, which is um, reflected in... Sorry, Mr. Simpson, could you be a bit louder, please? Well, this, my microphone was up against my ear. I was getting mirrored, so I apologise for Perfect. that. Um, hopefully you hear me loud and clear. Um, happy to speak to the, the stretch outcomes for to nine, which reflects the work of the Children's Services Board. Um, the, the Community Planning Aberdeen will be aware that the Children's Services uh, plan was refreshed at the start of this year uh, and came before the, this board um, earlier um, in April. And the, the activity is reflected in the refreshed outcomes that we are now working to deliver against um, each of the stretch outcomes. In relation to stretch outcome four, which um, seeks to improve the um, expected um, children reaching their developmental milestones by their 27 to 30 month review, you will see that there are two uh, new charters that are before the board today. One, to increase the number of PEEP programmes delivered by multi-agency partners and one to improve dental health to primary one um, aged children um, around that. So both these charters are before you and reflect really strong multi-agency activity to focus on ensuring that children have the very best start in life as well. We know that the areas of dental health are um, for children in our deprived areas is below what we would expect it to be and, and this aims to sort of focus on um, trying to close that gap, that health gap. We also recognise that through the pandemic perhaps children's opportunities to come together and learn in, uh, and share experiences um, have been um, thwarted um, and, and PEEP is a programme that has now been running in the city for for 20 years this, this coming month and, and, and has, has, has got strong community buy-in across our, our partnership as well. And again, this is hoping to think about how we can further expand the reach of the PEAT programme to ensure it is there. Convener, do you want me to pause there to, uh, if there's any questions in relation to those two new charters or would you be happy with me just to continue? Is there any questions? Are we happy to continue? Happy to continue, Mr. Simpson. 
Thank you very much. In relation to stretch outcome five, um, recognising that children and young people feel listened to at all time, there is um, again two further charters in here, increased by 5% the number of S1 to S6, S6 pupils who report that they feel confident by 2025 and increased 10 by 10% the percentage of children living in areas of deprivation who feel safe in their communities as well. So this very much builds upon the, the SHINE survey that was undertaken in the autumn of 2022, where we um, surveyed um, a large percentage of our school population and they told us their, their thoughts and feelings around areas um, that impacted upon their mental well-being uh, and their, their activity around this as well. So we have today that actually um, ensuring that the children feel confident. There's a range of, of, of improvements attached to the, the charter that's, that's before the community today, but really to ensure uh, the work that's been built upon through um, through schools and through the voice within our schools is 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 growing and, and continues to develop as well. This very much also lays the ground in preparation for the future incorporation of UNCRC into Scots law, ensuring that actually children's voice not only informs their own individual plans, but informs us how services are delivered to their needs as well. So really important that we absolutely hear the voice of, of our young people uh, in, in going forward as well. Recognising also that the, the SHINE survey told us that some of our young people didn't feel entirely safe within their communities. We've begun to think about how we can support that through increased uh, presence within the communities, increased activities within, within those communities for them to access safely. And again, this is the work that's been taken forward by uh, Craig and his team um, to, to try and drive that agenda forward as well. Again, convener, I'm happy to pause to see if there's any questions before I move on to stretch outcome six. Any questions? I might have a little one. You have uh, a 10% increase uh, in your plans, uh, but it's 80 to 90%. Is that a little bit optimistic? Because 80% is already quite very high. It is high, and and I think that should be should be welcomed. Um, I I think that perhaps that number doesn't. That, that my understanding, community would be that as a city wide figure. I think it's perhaps slightly lower in in the areas of 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 deprivation where this charter is particularly focused on, um, and and there, we want all our children to feel safe in their communities, um, for whatever reason, uh, and we need to begin to sort of enable them to feel as safe as well. I'm happy to take that comment back, however, convener, and feed it back into the group that actually is leading on, on that, that charter. Yeah, it'd be interesting because it says percentages of children living in areas of deprivation who feel safe in their communities and the actual number is 80.7 percent and uh, you know your aim is 90.7 so it's 10 percent more. Thank you for that. Important to be ambitious um, uh, for, for this as well but I, I take that point and I will feed it back into the group convener. In relation to stretch outcome six, which focuses on the um, the outcomes for our care experienced young people, there, there are um, before the, the the board this afternoon, there are uh, two further charters there to reduce by five percent the number of children entering the care system, and to um, ad by, by 5% and 80% of the multi-agency workforce will have successfully completed the corporate parenting um, training aligned to the promise by 2025. So both of those are really important. We recognise that the, the aspiration of the promise is to do, ensure that children remain within their families where it's safe for them to be, and, and that must be our, our overarching aspiration. This, however, recognises to, to achieve that, we need to build stronger community um, focus on, on, on supporting families, but also to ensure that we are supporting uh, families, uh, extended families, to, to enable them to, to reach uh, into families to support them where there is vulnerabilities and situations of risk and uncertainty around that as well. 
there's a there's three three areas of improvement there, including how do we actually support parents where there is um, some addiction challenges to better support uh, their families rather than having for the child to be escalated into a child protection process or indeed an emergency situation. So we want to try and get ahead of those emergency situations to better support families uh, in an early and preventative manner. Building on the next one, we, we recognise that we're all corporate parents, everybody in the board and around the room today is a corporate parent. And how do we absolutely fully reflect um, th that, or, or understand our duties to advocate and, and represent the, the, the needs of our, our, our care experienced young folk. Um, and this, so the, the online um, opportunity to uh, for corporate parenting training has been refreshed and will be launched in the coming months and, and will be made available to the workforce around this as well. It's also trying to ensure we actually are tracking who is completing this and actually understanding where there are perhaps gaps and areas we need to have a greater focus on um, around this as well. Again, convener, happy to pause. No question. So we can go next. Yep. Thank you. Um, in relation to stretch outcome seven, um, this is about improving the su and sustained positive destinations uh, for those in our priority neighbourhoods by 2026 as well. There, there is the the one charter that's before uh, before you today. Um, it's that's to increase to 50 the number of people completing more integrated health and care courses by 2025. This is recognising the opportunities that exist within our uh, care care op care sector and it's it's to recognize that local need and but also to try and develop more um enabled pathways for our for our young people to to enter that profession and see it as a profession of of choice and and, and really a positive one as well so so there's really a strong focus on how do we build those pathways and even if they they, they don't there are other pathways they can move into whether that's within early learning or or other areas around that as well so it's how do we develop those those care pathways to really ensure that there is a, a future line of, of uh, staff that are going to be there to support us as we all get elderly and older as well. So again, happy to pause on that before moving on to stretch outcome eight. No, you're okay. That's what you read, yeah, go for eight. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, stretch outcome eight is for, again, 83.5% fewer young people charged with an offence. So this this builds upon the work that's been done um, in, in, in the previous iteration of the, the Children's Services Plan, which was successfully achieved and which uh, Mrs Swanson referenced earlier in, in the agenda as well. Um, and so there are two charters here today. That's increased by 5% the number of 16 and 17 year olds who are diverted from prosecution by 2025 and 90% uh, of 16 and 17 year olds appearing at Sheriff court in relation to Lord Advocate's guidance will have had an assessment of their community support needs met. This very much builds upon the aspirations of the Children's Care and Justice Bill, which we're anticipating coming into effect um, next year at some point, uh, which really very much um, emphasises the need to ensure that 16 and 17 year olds are seen as children and not as uh, and not therefore considered within an adult justice system as well. It, it, it reflects the fact that we want to ensure that 16 and 17 year olds don't end up in prison um, as per the aspiration of the promise and indeed the intention of that legislation as well. And, and Scotland's done well uh, to do that. Um, we have moved from having a, a high number of 16 and 17 year olds within our um, adult prison uh, estate to, to a very, very much reduced number now. Uh, in fact, single figures as, as we speak, but we want to do better. We want to get that down to there. So again, how do we absolutely support those 16 and 17 year olds to be considered within the children's hearing, whatever possible, um, or indeed diverted away from prosecution into community uh, services that can support behavioural change that mitigates the need for um, uh, further offending behaviour, which brings demands on police and, and, and other agencies, including my own within children's social work as well. So this is very much picking up the intentions of that uh, care and justice bill and, and actually trying to get ahead and plan accordingly to meet that that need as we go forward. Um, happy to pause and pick up any questions that people may have. 
Yeah, let me add that 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 is is a very good aim, and it's a five percent aim, which is a, a realistic aim as opposed to a ten percent. So so I I do uh, uh, I do see the, the point of of moderated to five percent. We are already very high. Any other question or comment to Mr. Simpson? No. Next. Finally, convener from me, you'll be pleased, is stretch outcome nine, um, and that this, this, this focuses on our children with um, additional support needs or indeed disabilities that we would want to enhance their uh, experiences to achieve a positive destination by 2026 as well. This is an area which we're all focused on, and so there are two charters uh, before you today, um, increased by 5%, the percentage of young people with additional support needs entering a positive of destination and also by 2025 90% of families with children with an additional support need or disability will indicate they have access to peer and community support that meet their needs as well. So this very much builds upon our aspiration that no child is left behind, that we want to ensure that every child um, is able to fulfill their own potential, whatever that is, um, and, and, and recognising that we want to build different pathways for children with complex and enduring needs so that they can still have some, you know, fulfil, they can, they can provide a, a contribution to society beyond their time in school as well. So they're really trying to think about how do we absolutely maximise those opportunities and provide different pathways uh, for those those young adults when, when as, as they enter adulthood and, and leave school around that as well. So really thinking about those positive and indeed sustained destinations as well. We also know that the pandemic has been really difficult for families with, who, has a, who have a child with a disability or enduring health need. They have often felt services further away from them during that point and over, over those years when, when services were perhaps more restricted in terms of the support they could offer families, but also recognising the health needs of the child made it perhaps of greater risk for those services to come in and support them as well. So we want to really challenge ourselves that actually that, that, that they don't feel disconnected to those support Supports, that they feel that they have access to supports that actually meet their needs. It's not services that are designed by professionals, that we really want to take um, their voice in, and shape those services that better meet their needs. How can we build peer supports and peer-led supports that actually this 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 group of our population uh, can, can access and, and build upon as well. So we want to engage with them to ensure that their voices are really shaping the, 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 the outcomes that we're trying to achieve within this stretch outcome. Happy to pause and answer any questions on this. 91% base is, is a very good one. Yes, Councillor Cook. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank, thanks for that. Um, if you look at stretch outcome seven, it talks about 95% um, of all children will sustain a positive destination. Stretch outcome nine talks about 100% um, of children with support needs and disabilities experiencing a positive destination. I just wonder what the rationale does. It, is it just words are in, being used interchangeably or is there a, is there something more subtle there? I think the differentiation you highlight, Councillor Cook, is unhelpful. Um, and I think if we could have a greater level of consistency around that, it would be helpful. Can you allow me to take that back into the Children's Services Board in, in a couple of weeks' time and raise that and come back to you with, uh, with a clearer answer? Yep, that, that's fine. Thank you. And what's budget take, Councillor Cook? Any other question online? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Chris who will tell us more about happening. The last happening, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start with introducing um, the project aim, which was 11.3, which is to support 100 people to feel confident to promote well-being and good health choices by 2023. Um, and again, the report seeks approval to end the project as the aim has been achieved. Um, our initial review had highlighted that um, there were lots of people out in the field, kind of frontline workers who didn't feel comfortable bringing up topics about health and well-being. Um, they were a bit confused about where to signpost um, and where to access services. 
and also the established training that we had um, wasn't particularly useful in building confidence uh, around having a brief intervention. Um, so as a group, we looked at refreshing the uh, making of your opportunity count training, which is about creating a very brief intervention. Um, uh, but instead of having a, a focus there, we focused on the professional confidence to have that brief intervention. Um, and during this period, we had 96 people who were trained with 75 people showing improvements in awareness of issues that affect their individual um, that affect health and well-being of the individual, uh, confidence of speaking to people about health and well-being issues and confidence to have brief interventions. We noticed that there was a small drop off in confidence between the post training evaluation um, and the pre evaluation. Um, but we, we identify that it's always uh, expected uh, with training that there's always a kind of drop in afterwards. But we continue to kind of look at leads within each of the services to make that improvement so they can continue having that dialogue with individuals um, and teams to make sure that they, the dialogue can continue to happen about MIOC. And again, you can come back to uh, the kind of project team and um, discuss any challenges, any further training opportunities um, from that. But even like um, in the, the past um, training we've done recently, um, we've seen a, a more in terms of the baseline reports, we've seen a more, more increased uh, confidence rate amongst professional staff as opposed to um, be frontline staff who are kind of put the coal face of, of doing that. So again, uh, we're keen to look at a baseline for each of the services coming online with that, uh, as well as a, a a lead for me that's an organisation uh, and we will continue to baseline that service and, and see appropriate what, what appropriate support we can put in, whether that's a full New York training programme, whether it's a bit of hybrid between access to kind of online support and um, just bringing things on a, a on a regular basis to team meetings and kind of continue that conversation. But again, building in that kind of a, a yearly um, confidence review so we can continually review and update that training as required. Um, and since the report has gone in, there's been a bit of work done at a grampian level through realistic medicine, which is kind of aiming to kind of look at how we're doing the kind of making every opportunity kind of training across grampian and look at how we can kind of share practice and look at um, best practice across that. Um, in addition to that, we also did identify that um, although we had well established um, community representation in the locality empowerment groups and the private neighbourhood partnerships, there was still a need to kind of reach out to other groups who were not participating in those and getting the voice heard. Um, so we were fortunate enough to recruit a health improvement officer with um, experience of delivering health issues in the community training, which is a community development approach to getting um, people to look at community voices, at the community um, issues that affect people in their communities regarding health and wellbeing. And we piloted that with some of the local empowerment group members. Um, and from that, we were able to recruit staff from the Aberdeen State Health and Social Care Partnership, Aberdeen Council Community Land Development, Bernardo's, Greg and Aberdeen Foy to undertake the HIC tutor training, which will allow this to be kind of delivered within the community. Um, and we did that in March. And since then, we've had, um, as part of the kind of tutor process, the participants have uh, had to kind of deliver sessions to different groups. So we've had 114 people participated in the HIC workshop to date from both professional and community groups. Um, again, with the aim of promoting that locally. And from that, we've got 11 participants have highlighted they're keen to be involved in um, future groups. And also they can highlight particular groups within localities and communities that they could get involved in and deliver that. Um, going forward, um, the HIC work will be incorporated into the Community Empowerment Improvement Project, uh, increase the number of people, staff and communities who state that they have skills, tools and support they need to work better to, to make improvements in the community by 50% by 2025. And that, that, that data will monitor that project as well. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any question online in the room? No, thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, uh, response. Uh, if we happy to agree the recommendation, which on page 282, note and consider the overview of progress towards the 16 stretch outcomes and 89 improvement projects, approve the 11 project charters as contained in Appendix 2, and approves the two project and reports contained at Appendix 3. 
Are we all agree? Thank you. Uh, we'll go uh, straight to the next one, which is 4.1, uh, meeting date 2024, uh, space 307-308. You will have time to look at the meeting dates for 2024. No reservation or questions. Uh, it's for approval, so everybody agree. And for noting, the next meeting will be on 29th of November 2023. So uh, I will all see you in November. And thank you very much for your attendance online in the present. And we'll try to be in a better room next time. This room doesn't fit very well for community planning. So uh, we we are uh, uh, experiencing some some work to try to have better digital uh, uh, in in our community room. So next time we'll be in community room. Councillor Riley. Sorry, Commissioner. Can I just double check? There was another project end report um, on tobacco smoking. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you should have said, Mrs. Smiley. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, so uh, we're going to um, the project end, end report for 11.4, which was sought to reduce tobacco smoking by 5% overall by 2023. And again, seek the approval to end report as a, the aim has been achieved. Um, again, similar to the, the kind of project around about reducing tobacco, it, um, it's very much taken a kind of multi-agency approach, focusing on prevention, cessation uh, and protection. A lot of the work we kind of evolved around was about in terms of prevention was um, increasing the number of organisations to take action on uh, tobacco by signing up to the Scotland Charter for Tobacco Free Generation. Um, and we did that by uh, a number of ways, but one of them that particularly worked was by introducing the charter through the Health Improvement Fund uh, with a way of trying to encourage people to sign up through that process. Um, again, in terms of prevention, uh, linking back with frontline services, um, we did work with the youth work services in November um, around about discussing tobacco and vaping with young people, which again um, highlighted a lot of co uh, confidence from the youth workers who said that people are wanting to have honest conversations around about vaping. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity. Um, our cessation su support um, delivered by NHS Grampian and the pharmacy teams um, again, utilising a social media campaign to increase uptake in smoking cessation services and then again working with maternity services to use an app uh, as a tool to help people stop smoking. Again, that was identified as a community idea within the central locality plan. Um, and, and finally, in terms of protection, about refreshing and, and continue to roll out the support for smoke-free homes and um, particularly focused on uh, organisations and teams working with people with younger children. Um, happy to say that over the region of 2018 to most recent data, we've um, 20, we've gone from 21% of people smoking current smokers to 15%. Um, in terms of maternal smoking rates, um, they've also improved. When uh, 2019, with 13.4% of people smoked antenatal smoked, um, and that has dropped to 11.7% in 2022. Um, and again, within the most deprived quintile, there's been a 15% reduction in, in three-year aggregates. Still, we still a lot of work to do, um, and particularly within the, the SFMD 1-2 areas, there's a bit of work. But again, that links back to um, the work that's happening at the moment. So we're expecting a kind of new national strategy for reducing smoking prevalence to come out. Um, we're in the process of refreshing the Grampian Tobacco Strategy Plan. Um, again, and widening that to ensure that it covers the whole range of partners, including uh, our trade and standards colleagues um, in the council, as well as our kind of NHS colleagues across the, the piece. Um, and again, um, the, the action plan for the Grampian will be reported via uh, NHS Grampian, but also the uh, Health and Social Care Partnership and Outcome Framework. Happy to take any questions. I couldn't forget such an important report, especially with the news that uh, we will have a consultation now on vaping, uh, and and that will be interesting for for, for all of us to to participate to this consultation to know uh, if uh, a banning uh, uh, should be should be enforced or not. Any question on that particular report? No. Oh yes, Councillor Radley. That's the reason you knew about it. You had a question for it. Less of a question, more of a comment. Um, it is really welcome to see the reduction, and I agree with you. Um, there is more to be done with regards to smoking, especially um, among sort of the pregnant population. Um, and I was very pleased to, to see the recognition that vaping is also 
an increasing problem, especially among our young people um, within the council is we've just launched the charter around um, cash sales um, in Union Street as a way to discourage um, the proxy purchasing of vapes for underage children. But um, I do think there needs to be more of a focus, um, what multi-agency on vaping, especially um, with the sort of under 16 population. Um, we don't know the, the sort of impacts that it may have on health, um, but maybe we need to be looking at a nicotine strategy rather than a tobacco strategy um, moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, no, absolutely. I think, um, to be perfectly honest, the um, Aberdeen Tobacco Free Alliance that has been meeting for the last year and kind of delivering this, this work has predominantly been held up by with vaping discussions for the last kind of 12 months. Um, and there has been a lot of work done in terms of supporting for from primary schools and looking at different pilots. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think there's a need to probably build upon uh, that piece of work and to make sure that there's continuity across and not only Aberdeen, but also across um, Grampian. Again, there's discussions. We've got a kind of Grampian wide group looking at this as well. So I keen to maximise the, the work that's going on. And even in the last kind of few months, um, there's been a bit of work done um, looking at trade standards, the proxy sales as, as well. Um, so absolutely need to focus on that. Thank you very much for that. Maybe the fire rescue services want to uh, to give us a view on on the the fire hazard of vaping uh, compared to the fire hazard of smoking. I think I think it's going to be an interesting time to see uh, if if the increase on vaping, uh, if the constitution decides is going to be banned, will increase. Uh, smoking on the same hand, you know, uh, with, with a lot of watch, but on safety, maybe you want to say a word on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, try that again. Uh, we haven't seen a significant increase of fire caused by uh, vaping at the moment, with most vapes being disposable, which obviously the Scottish Government are trying to uh, ban in the near future. We may see an increase. Um, the issue that we currently have is the inappropriate disposal of these types of devices. Um, so when they do go to recycling centres or landfill, that then causes us the issue with fire. Um, but as far as vaping at the moment, we don't have a significant issue with that. As a disposal over one in case, Mr. Um, I, I guess it was just a plea to say smoking cessation is still really important as well as. So I think it's a yes and. Um, the, the, there, have, there has been uh, quite a bit of work done um, following uh, teachers raising concerns around this issue, um, but again, trying to influence nationally. So um, Ash Scotland um, were up in Aberdeen this week, and so there are a number of connects now being made with Public Health Scotland, Ash Scotland, etc., cetera, uh, to tackle this once for Scotland. So a very valued hand uh, a report and a good one to finish on, even if I had finished off <laughs> <laughs> the meeting. So thank you very much for, for everyone. Thank you again, Mr. Smiley. We won't go through the commission again. I think everybody agrees on them. And see you all in November. Thank you.